we will start with a confession I have to make because I have to get this off my chest. Um, so I have never really used deep learning before the invitation to this workshop. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks for that. I didn't expect applause about that, but I will take it. So, um, <laughs> and I also felt like yesterday it was something like uh, we can't talk about computer vision without talking about deep learning. It was more or less a citation, I think. Watch me. <laughs> I might do this, uh, at least for a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I feel a bit like the odd one out, um, but I think maybe it's also nice to have. I don't know. It, to me, it feels a bit like an advertisement break, but that's hopefully not the only attention, uh, intention of this session. Um, but I think we had some very heavy stuff in the morning, and now it's more a bit like what is already out there, what we can use, maybe what we can play around with, because honestly, um, the first step to research often is playing around with things. Um, before we start with the more serious stuff. So I also wanted to give you uh, another uh, way to see um, uh, my perspectives on this presentation. So um, what I really come from in this in this talk, I also can very well play the developer role, I guess, but in this talk, I, I'm playing the role of a user, just as you are looking forward to use cases and to use <laughs> tools. And I'm also, I have this perspective, and I put it also in the title, on really digital humanities. And I think this is somewhat important because um, um, I think in the beginning we had some very different terms on what we're doing with digitization. Then we all started to somehow converge on this uh, digital humanities stuff. And I think now we're on, on, on the verge of diverging again. So into, I don't know, humanities computing and, and maybe even data science. And they again become somewhat kind of different animals. And I'm really on the digital humanities side or even at a lower point because I'm on the digitizing humanities side. So I'm really, I'm working with more or less traditional researchers most of the time in my daily work where, where they don't really know what the opportunities are, what they can do in the digital realm and where they are working in very, very small research fields that no one is really looking into when we talk about big data or anything like that. And so they have a really, really um, large gap that has to be bridged. And also, I'm coming from the research-driven side. Um, uh, Sarah, you have mentioned this term yesterday, I think, and maybe we'll also mention it tomorrow again, most likely. Um, I'm not com coming from a curation-driven perspective, so I'm not um, on the collection side of things, but rather on the aggregation side of things that you normally have in research and analysis topics. And then I tried to uh, put my finger down on what is the, the, the common ground on everything I'm doing. And I thought, OK, the most fitting description is something like, mostly I'm dealing with images of text witnesses. So it could be a wall in a grave in ancient uh, Egypt, or it could be a coffin uh, in such grave, or it could be books, or it could be Torah scrolls. Um, but they are all their material from the cultural heritage that are somehow bearing text. But there is much more to them than just being the witness for the text. They are also <coughs> the witness for other material. So the motivations to pick an off-the-shelf solution, I think it has come up uh, in other sessions too. Um, so why would you look for an off-the-shelf solution? Why would you have expectations to maybe find one that fits your needs? So the first thing, of course, is we are all dealing somehow with interdisciplinary research. So we are always uh, the servants of uh, two masters, so to speak. So we have to really dig deep into something on the humanities side, and we are also somewhat expected to dig deep into the technical side of things. And somewhere you have to find shortcuts or to, to find good solutions that are fitting to your problem without losing too much time. And also, of course, you're always on, uh, uh, at the problem that you think, okay, I can only go so far on the technical side, so maybe I would rather trust in the product of experts than doing something on my own, which is not a bad idea in general. The second thing is that you often have somewhat medium-sized data, so it's not really something you think about when you, when you think big data, but you can also have very heterogeneous data, for example, so it's still, uh, it has some variety. And then you're at the breaking point between do I really want to train a system or if I start training a system, is this not half of my solution already and could I not do it by hand or could it not do it in another way? The third thing is that um, we often deal with the exploration of cultural heritage, so you never really know what to expect. So often you really go into the unknown. So you, from the get-go, you don't know your data too well um, and you don't know how to define the problem to deal with it. 
And uh, the last thing is, and I think we have seen that plenty uh, over the last days, so computer vision is huge and it's also a fast moving field. And sometimes you have the feeling that you might not be able to catch up or to keep up. And you also have the nagging feeling that your solution might be already out there. So why I was uh, stressing my digital humanities focus is, uh, and uh, I don't know if everyone agrees on, on, on that splitting I'm trying to do here, is that if we're speaking about tools, we might mean really, really different things if we talk about the digital humanities focus and the data science focus. Um, and I'm not saying one side is better than the other or anything like that, but you have really different, different requirements or different goals to reach. So for the digital humanities, uh, most often the scholars are in focus as a user um, so you want to provide some software and services for them. They should be somewhat easy to use. And normally they're meant to do uh, to be used in a manual way or maybe a semi-automatic way. But normally the user has to have some influence on what they are doing. And what the user is normally looking for um, is some kind of durability and reliability. So if you're talking to humanities scholars, it's not rare that they say, okay, I still want to use this tool in 10 years, in 20 years. We have archive projects, we have we have really long-term projects. We have to uh, have those tools running really reliably and really sustainability, uh, sustainable. And on the other hand, the data science focus is quite different from that. So uh, normally you have data scientists as developers or as whatever the correct term for that would be. Um, the lingua franca at the moment is notebooks uh, um, in, in any shape and form, I would say. And you would focus on automatic tasks, on uh, maybe application, um, uh, on APIs. And you're also trying to, to follow up with this cutting edge techniques. Um, and your, your main focus would be on reusability and adaptability. And of course, the, the tools I've, I, I'm showing on the, on the bottom left have nothing to do with computer vision, but they are really the, the, the <laughs> somewhat very old workhorses that still exist in digital humanities. like. Um, Whenever you come up with a problem, uh, someone will be in the room that says, you can do that with two-step. And um, two-step is a tool that is so old that uh, it's, it's quite ancient in regards to digital humanities. But still, there are some experts um, out there that are really using these very, very old tools. So what do I mean if I say off the shelf? Um, or what does it mean in reality? Uh, to use? I don't know, pick, pick a random research tool uh, that is surely wonderful. Um, to use such a tool, you only need to do the following steps. So most often you would like to get a, new, a very specific Unix system, maybe even a very old one, because the tool is already old. You have to install a lot of complex dependencies. You have to build the application. Um, you will run into errors uh, in a specific uh, programming language the application was built in. You need to most likely install and configure a specific database um, to work with the system, and then you have to make them talk to each other properly, and then you're ready to use. So that is quite often the reality on using tools in research contexts. It doesn't feel that off the shelf anymore if you think about it like that. So this is why we did uh, yesterday all that struggle with the Docker installation, because that is the best compromise at the moment we have in the field. We do some package shipping. So instead of the developer having to talk to the user and to tell them how to set up the, the application, the developer tells the system how to do it. So it basically tells the Docker in between and the Docker deals with all the tedious stuff. The benefit is that it's very easy to write on the developer side. So setting up a Docker file is really, really easy. Um, it is somewhat easy to use on the user side. We will see about that. Um, there is a steep learning curve in the beginning for Docker, I would say. What's really nice to have is that both sites are working on a very well-defined environment because you can really say, okay, I ran the Docker file and this and that happened. Um, and the developer can really see and, and reproduce if something goes wrong. And in, in the ideal case, you have less bug reports to handle that are specific to, to an operation system or something like that. And also, it is very nice because you have a very clear and transparent documentation of installation requirements because it's already in the Docker file. So if you are looking for tools and you find something on GitHub um, after you have, I would say, involved uh, Docker in your workflow, you're really, that's the first thing you look for. You say, oh, there's a Docker file. Great. I have a starting point. 
Um, so it becomes a good habit to use that if you want to try something out quickly. It's just it's a way where you can really say, okay, it's like an installation wizard um, on my platform. So when I was um, preparing that, that talk, I was really a bit puzzled where to start. Computer vision is huge. Tool is not really well defined. How do I go about that? It was it was really a struggle. And then I uh, decided on this. I'm not sure it's the ideal way to do so, but I decided on, I want to show you some showcases what something enables for you. Because you will run through a re requirement analysis or a decision flow in the beginning of your project where you say, okay, I have a problem, I can somewhat describe it. What do I do now? What do I use now? So the first point would be, do you even need computer vision? I mean, you are all here because you're taking some interest. You're all here because you feel like you need computer vision. That is very valid. But of course, there are sometimes other concepts and I just want to mention them. So of course, instead of letting a computer look at your problem, maybe you can have many people look at the problem. So citizen science projects, for example, are, are a good way to do something uh, regarding uh, data projects that are really interesting to do on, on very small details, for example. The second thing is I could use computer vision, but I could use it basically with all the machine learning. Um, and then you would fall to something like a mathematical morphology. And I would show you a use case of that. Or you could say, okay, I need computer vision and I want to do it with unsupervised learning because I don't know that much about my data. I want to do some exploration stuff and unsupervised learning will fit my use case the best. Then you would be in the realm of clustering. You could say, okay, I want the computer vision and I want to use pre-trained data and pre-trained models and we will have a look at that. And then you can say, okay, I want to do computer vision and the whole year and I want to do some transfer learning. And I won't talk about that because you've heard about that uh, already a lot. And uh, yeah, you will hear about it again tomorrow, I would say. So this structure is what I will show you over the next uh, few minutes and uh, uh, the next time. So I, I added to the method and the, the topics some example cases and the tools I want you to show. Um, so for the first one, for the mathematical morphology, I picked an image segmentation use case and I will show you the, the tool Larex. Um, for the clustering approach, I want to show you image search, which is the, the tool of the VGG group called WISE. And then I will shortly talk about uh, ways to, to have a ready to use tool for all that um, deep learning and uh, pre-trained model stuff. And that would be deep detect. And um, as you can see here is that I didn't choose a path where I want to compare solutions because I think that's not really fitting. So I don't want to say, okay, this is better than that. I think that would not, that would also make the, the, the tool sec section really, really hard to do and to deal with. So really I was focusing on different use cases and this was uh, specifically meant to be. So the first thing, image segmentation. You've heard about image segmentation again, uh, already today, maybe with a more difficult use case. Um, so one showcase for computer vision without machine learning. Image segmentation is something that is quite deeply ingrained in the digital humanities because you use it a lot in document analysis. So in analysis of um, documents in regards to the layout, so of the position of things on the page and on classifying the things on the page. So if you look at the book page, or in this case, a book page, you never really look at the, at the whole page normally, but you take a specific interest into something, some elements of the page. Most often it's the text, but there are, is other stuff around it. So there is, for example, the decoration, the initials, uh, the margins with which have uh, text on it. Um, so you really want to separate, to sort it, maybe to define a reading order. Um, so document analysis is something you, you, you really often need to to um, work with images of, of books or newspapers or whatever you have in that area. So this is where we come to the tool Larex. <coughs> Larex is a semi-automatic open source tool for layout analysis and region extraction on early printed books. Um, it was created because there was a gap there. So you, you are between the hand uh, written character recognition of medieval manuscripts and on the well-working OCR of more modern 
the types of books uh, and you really have a gap for the early printed books because you have um, very specific fonts in there. You have, um, of course, trouble with German language that is not really regulated. So normal uh, off-the-shelf OCR versions, uh, solutions do not work. This was why Larix was created. And it was from the get-go meant for the average user um, and it was meant to be easy and standardized, um, uh, to be easily in integrated into a standardized workflow. So it was really meant as a pre-processing tool or as a correction tool in OCR workflows. And what the core is about is that you have some automatic suggestion of the, of the computer, but you have some ways to manually correct it. So um, you always give the user the opportunity to work with what the, what the computer is suggesting just by just going through the book themselves. And um, the concepts behind are very, very easy technically. So you are applying some mathematical morphology to the images while the user vision stays basically the same. So the user always see the unprocessed page, but the computer vision um, uh, converts it by doing some kind of binarization and dilation and contour detection and other steps of mathematical morphology to the, to the page. And in this case, you see, it's a very simple case. You would have a text line. And of course, as a, as a user, it's easy to identify that as a text line. And for the computer, it's utilized by, by doing this dilation so much that everything blends together that it's in the same line of text. And then you can identify it by basically finding the contour around it. And like I said, this mathematical morphology, those are really easy filter operations on, on the images. Um, for example, you see on the left-hand side, the dilation. So if you define a kernel which has a specific size, you can you can give to the to the program. And the rule for dilation is that the gray one is background, the orange one is foreground, and whenever the the structural element or kernel, while sliding over the image, touches something that is foreground, um, the center of the kernel, so uh, this 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 element here, becomes foreground if it wasn't before. And this um, leads to a way that basically the shape gets bigger. In a, in a very clear cut way, so you still contain the edge. So mathematical morphology is, if you talk to computer scientists, it's very boring. <laughs> it's it's really old school. It's it's also quite academic. So people say, okay, I learned this in an introduction to computer vision, and then I never use it. But still, um, with the tool Larix, um, they were able to utilize it in a way that it works quite quite well on many use cases. And uh, since it was involved in a semi-automatic tool, you really have a way to, to, sh to, to shape how it works in your use case. And mathematical morphology, of course, has, has many advantages because it's very, very fast. Um, it's very computational and undemanding, um, and it's also quite comprehensible and adjustable. And if you want to dive deeper into that, we will uh, later have an exercise where you can try out those operations of mathematical morphology and stitch them together for your own workflow. The second use case I'm bringing today is about image search or image similarity search. Um, and it is a use case of computer vision with unsupervised learning. So the technical background, or somewhat technical background, of course, for data representations, you're normally used to having pixel images. You also now over the course have learned a lot of other ways to, <laughs> to represent the images for deep learning. And you also have the way to do it in key point or feature descriptors, um, which you see on the right hand side in a, in a visualized way. So of course, as you can scale a pixel image um, and you will get a lower quality and um, less detail in the image, you can also somewhat scale the feature descriptors. So you really have to decide on the number of feature descriptors that represent your image. So a feature descriptor uh, describes your image in a way that it only highlights structurally important or interesting points of the image. Um, so you get a really, really reduced um, way of describing the image to store it, to index it, to search for it. I won't go into the detail of feature descriptors. I think that would take everything too far, um, but I just wanted to name drop some of them because um, you will stumble upon them sooner or later, I would guess. So they have sift or surf, or brief or org or root sift. And some of them are combinations of other ones. And really what they're trying to do is to, um, yeah, to advance the efficiency while not losing quality on the feature description and the feature matching. 
So that is exactly what you want to do with feature descriptors. You want to do matching of images. You want to identify in two images how they match in a way that it is meaningful. Um, you can see in this example, of, for, um, you, have, you have a woodcut uh, illustration on an early printed book, and you want to identify where in your corpus this image appears. And you see in the middle, you see a visualization of matching um, feature descriptors between your input image on the left and your output or your, your uh, requested image on the right. And if you say now this is not very meaningful in the middle, you're completely right. So this is just some matches, but it's not really the good ones. So we have to filter for relevant matches. Um, to filter for relevant matches, um, we have to limit by, by clustering the spatially possible or meaningful matches. Um, and we want to reduce it in a way that we can get from region A to region B by scaling, rotating, and sharing only, which means we really have a, a useful or plausible or reasonable kind of homography. So you can see that in the bottom, so these are all the plausible um, ways an object can move between two image frames. So it is rotated, it was basically standing like this here and standing like this here. Um, it is of course translated on the, on the image, it can move uh, on the image. Um, it is somewhat shifted in, in, in 3D, which means that there is some sharing involved and it is also scaled by pulling it further back from the camera or putting it further um, onto the camera. So deal, um, if, if um, feature matching is involved, you're dealing with this kind of homography transformation. So the image that device works like that. Um, and the factors for quality are, of course, um, interfering with the factors for project setup time. So the better the quality you want to, to reach, uh, the, the, the more likely you have to increase your project setup time. So you have to find a balance between those resources you have. Um, the things you can directly influence are image size and quality. So really your pixel based data input. Um, also the number of key points you want to be detected on the, on the image, which you can configure on the start. And of course, the applicability of a pre-trained vocabulary that is already shipped with WISE. And if this is not the route you can go with because um, the pre-trained vocabulary doesn't work on your use case, which very well might be the case, then you have some training parameters to also um, use. And I think I skipped the slide and I will go back to that for now. Um, so we were here, like, okay, we're matching two images. Two image, matching two images is quite easy. But that's never what, what we want to do with computer vision. Comparing more than 100,000 images in comparison is quite hard um, because it's computational intensive. It's especially intensive on, on the memory of your machine. So what we do to, you, uh, to, to resolve that problem basically is the concept of visual bags of words. I think it's also quite, quite old by now. You, you would know the date most likely of when, when people started using visual bags of words, but it's like 10 years or something like that, I would say. Even before that, maybe. So it's also not cutting edge technology, <laughs> um, but it works quite well. Yeah. So uh, it, it works quite well for scaling image search for to, to large data sets. Um, it's a good concept to use. Um, and what you do is basically, um, like you would do with a text, you basically um, try to find visual words on your image um, to, to, to make sense of your image, so to speak, and to use a vocabulary to find those words in your uh, in your images to do the matching. And this speeds up and uh, makes the scaling of your image search uh, quite quite well. Like I said, um, you can you can factor the, the, the quality by, by tweaking the training parameters or the, 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 the key point numbers, um, but you have to know other things about the image search or you have to be aware of. So the search is based on key point detection, which means it is quite robust against color differences, which is for some use cases, nice to have, and for some use, use cases, use, case, use cases, uh, terrible because that's exactly what you want to know. Um, and you're relying on structurally distinct features. So for something like um, a woodcut on a, on a page, it's great. It's awesome because you have very clear, um, clear structural uh, features, but for other use cases, it might not work as well. 
And your search is based on homography, which means um, <coughs> it's methodical, um, incapable to deal with warping. So what you saw here, I think on, on one of the images, you could see it a bit. Uh, it's not that large, but you have some, some warping of the page here. Um, for example, so you, you get some quality loss there because um, it's not a rectangle anymore. And the affine transformation that is uh, uh, created by a homography transformation, it can't deal with that. It's not the tool to use that. Um, so it's not really fit for that, but in most use cases, it is, doesn't matter that much or doesn't decrease the quality as much. And also um, the method is incapable of detecting uh, mirrored objects. It's just also, I said rotation and, and scaling, but no mirroring. So that's just not possible. So if you need a use case like that, you have to do it on the data side. So WISE was um, uh, created in, okay, so visual words have to be older than 10 years, I would expect if it was in a PhD research in 2014. Um, it was it was a code base of a PhD research, um, and then it somehow went a bit in hibernation. There was just a very limi um, uh, limited support, and then uh, it was it was rewoken a bit. And now we have installation kits for Windows and for Mac somewhat, which is really nice to have for this tool because it's really, really great. It comes with a pre-trained vocabulary, but it also allows you to do some unsupervised training on your own data. It just is a bit time and CPU con consuming. <coughs> and the search scales well on large data sets, as I said, but you might need a server environment for that. So if you start, um, yeah, using it heavily on um, for for search, then you might need something that exceeds the memory of a of a home PC. And uh, it is situated both for manual use, so it has a graphical user interface, and also automatic use because it provides uh, URL parameters and a JSON response format, which is nice. So Vice is, uh, I would say, a good all-rounder on structural image matching, but you have to be aware it's, it's structural image matching. So Vice does not provide any kind of object de detection or anything like that. So it really doesn't know what's in the image. It's just structural matching. Um, it is a huge C++ code base. So if you <coughs> run into trouble um, and you are not fond of doing things with C++ or even a bit old school C coding style, then you might run into trouble if you want to fix anything. Um, the parametrization is more or less lightly documented and the JSON output is not fully human readable. You might see that if you want to try the exercise later, um, but still it's, it's overall, it's good to use and uh, quite mature. The third use case is object detection or this, that's not even true. And in, in fact, it's face detection. So um, maybe this term is way too broad. Um, or not really fitting, but I didn't want to limit it too much. So computer vision with pre-trained models. So if you want to start with something, it's really hard to determine what you can use, what is already out there and what you can do. Um, first of all, as we go back to that, is you can ask something like a Google Vision AI demo, <laughs> for example. So you can just go to your browser, open the page of Google Vision AI, scroll down where you can input your file and throw it in there and see what it does. So you would get a first idea of what is possible with, with the Google Vision AI, but normally you have trouble to find something that has a similar experience on the open source side of things. And this is what basically the mission of Deep Detect would be. So it's an open source client server model for deep learning. Um, so you can either use the server only, or you could use um, the server instead of the client. And it eases the way into usage of deep learning because you can quickly set it up and try something without writing a single line of code, which is quite nice to have. And it has sim similar usability to commercial APIs. You have basically a shelf of options to choose from. You have many predefined models where you can just start out with things and most likely get very, very quickly frustrated that they don't work on your data set, but you can at least try. And it's also not limited on image use cases. Also, you can do something on texts as well. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's a very generic and broad tool um, that you can use to try things out. Yeah. I really understand how this uh, software, the idea behind the software. So basically there's an image and the software is able to, because it has been trained somehow, it, it 
sorry, is able to determine that, for instance, in this picture, we have a, a watch or a clock, and then we have yeah. one. So <laughs> this is, an, is a model for image uh, classification mm -hmm. with at least four classes, <laughs> most likely many more. <laughs> um, this is a, a, I wouldn't say it's in the realm of object detection, most likely, but it's a bit hard to, to place for me, honestly. So it um, detects emotion in a face. So it detects a face and emotion. And this one is the same for, for finding um, clothes uh, types. So very different models. This is what I mean with off the shelf. You go to the, to the, to the website and there's like, I don't know, 17 models or something. And they are really doing different stuff on, on images. And you can start with that and can say, okay, I need a classification tool. Let's try. Um, so that's what, what the idea behind the tool is. Yeah. Is that the problem Sorry. Is that, is that in, is the, are those classes or are those labels on object and image? I was wondering that the proton accelerator, it's a, an aberration from the software. I can't answer you that, but we can have a look together. Maybe that would. Is that not, it's so, yeah, it's yeah. So um, I'm not exactly sure if I can pinpoint your, your question even properly. So maybe we have a look later and, and decide on, on the answer together. Um, yeah. So pre-trained models, I mean, they, they bring some promise to the table, like they are a solution to every problem, especially the image classification models. Um, it's hard to say something about that because use cases in humanities are as diverse as human culture itself. So sometimes pre-trained models might be a very viable route for you because you're interested in something that, that already has a solution out there. And for some of you, use cases, it might be really, really absurd to expect something from a pre-trained model. So it, it really differs um, and depends on the use case. So um, yeah, pre-trained models can at least aid the distinction um, between hard and easy tasks somewhat, because you can see, okay, that's already solved, or no, that doesn't work at all. <coughs> and this brings me to my last um, example, image classification. That would be computer vision with this transfer learning, but I'm really out of my depth here. <laughs> I, like I said, from the user perspective, and I can't tell you anything in depth about it because you saw my initial confession. Um, but I wanted to show you that once you're starting a route, like going, for example, for something like deep detect, of course, they also give you the opportunity to then pre-train, uh, to then uh, do transfer learning on, on pre-trained models. And I also wanted to use this opportunity to sneak in basically my own research experience, um, even if this is a talk about tools, um, because I use some of the tools or some of the methods of the tools in my own research. And basically I stitched it together in a research workflow. So the first step was to detect for me illustrations in, in book pages. I was really only interested in the illustrations and nothing else. Um, and then I wanted to detect the reuses because in early modern times, when people started to print books as more or less mass media, they really reused their woodcuts again and, and again and again. And I wanted to see how they reused it, where they reused it, um, what happened with them during reuse, if they switched context, if they switched um, from, from one book to another, and really to get some insight on how printers worked in the 16th century. And like I said, I had to first detect it on the page. Then I did the search based on this region of interest that was created from the detect detection, detection. And then I got a lot and lot of data that basically said, this is a reuse because it's always the same image. And then I went through them manually and at least sorted those out that were not interesting to me because I was, for example, not interested in my use case in decorations. So I wanted to get rid of them. I wasn't interested in um, something like printer's marks, which are really, really hard to distinguish from illustrations. And I wasn't interested in initials. And if you have something like this, it's just a very simple administrative view, uh, graphical user interface. You can read pretty uh, go through it. Have the decoration, decoration, initial decoration. Oh, okay, plant illustration, I will keep that. And this way I tagged, I don't know, around 900 reuses or something like that. So basically my whole application was something like this. I took the printing output of one city in the 16th century um, to some degree of completeness, because of course I was, I was relying on the, on the data that was there um, and that I could use. 
So I had thousands of books to process and of course hundreds of thousands of book pages, I think something like 650,000 or something like that. And I really integrated those tools in my workflow to get from just book pages, there might be an illustration on it or not, um, to basically the labels on illustration reuse and then the analysis of this illustration reuse. And when I prepared for this workshop, I realized, yeah, sorry. But the precondition was that, of course, the book pages were digitalized. <coughs> yeah. They yes. Didn't have to do the digitalization no. Process. Exactly. That's what I said when I uh, meant when I said I'm coming from a research-driven um, uh, way to look at things. So I was really relying on the on the libraries to to provide me with digitalization and also to provide me with standardized um, output of their digitalization workflows to reuse it. That was. It has gotten better over the last years. Um, it was. It was not in a good shape a few years ago. Um, yeah, but I only reused the data. Um, but I also specifically decided on a use case where the data came from very heterogeneous data um, sets. So sometimes libraries try to do something like that themselves, but they have really, really good control on how an output of their digi digitization workflow looks like. So it's a comparatively easy task to do that. And then you combine it from, I don't know, 40 libraries or something like that. And then many, many things go wrong. <laughs> So I was really was interested in looking at the more heterogeneous data. Uh, manual tagging not make all these things useless because the principle is the worst place in the chain is the weak weak in weak in place. It means that all that things will struggle in uh, manual tagging and even. If the other tasks are made faster, manual tagging is the slowest one. So all the children. Yes, it is. But I was only able to do so by doing all the, the pre-processing steps, to, so to speak. I would not have been able to do anything manually on the original data, of course. But after the pre-processing, it was quite easy to do in comparison. Um, and what I was doing was basically some kind of cleanup. And of course, I could have involved other options and some what I was, at some cases I did it semi-automatically or automatically, but manual tagging was important to do, especially on cases I haven't prepared that to bring, but especially on something like printer's marks, because printer's marks are something like a printer puts something in a book somewhere where he says, I printed this book. And you really can't, by, by a method, um, really distinguish them from illustrations because they are illustrations. They are just illustrations for a very specific purpose. And to get them out, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be proven wrong, but I think it's really, really hard to do in a different way than doing it in a manual way. Classification, image classification, uh, not need to work with contextual analyzing because it can say here is the case. What so every page on the medieval books have cast cast castles on it. I'm not sure I'm getting what you what you're at. Uh, image classification say in this uh, uh, image you have a castle. And it's not a big thing because yep. on medieval near all pictures have castle. Then it is need not to have contextual analyzing of after the classification in castle, in river, in that year, mm -hmm. in uh, that position with uh, I don't know, Baroque or whatever structure, or, yeah. but it's mean that to do context, contextual description of the image, not just for simple classification. This mm -hmm. is castle, this is a uh, uh, boat, this is a uh, sheet, this is, I mm -hmm. don't know what. But I wasn't going for that. So I would be happy if someone now can do that with my data, um, but I, I wasn't going for that uh, at all. But yeah, that, that is what I'm going, uh, where I'm going now, basically, because now that you have that data, it's really, really to you, uh, easy to use it for deep learning. I would think, I will look into that further um, over the time I have now, um, because I really, I use that manual tagging for classes or a classification, but you could do other things with that, I guess. Um, so I use all the stuff that I sorted out in my manual tagging to use it on, on, a, on a classifier with four classes. So I try to use it on initials, decorations, printers, marks, and plants. Um, the, the first three were really, really easy because I had already, already tagged them. And the fourth one was really easy because it was the most prevalent thing in my in my data set. 
So the most prominent reuses were always plants, always um, medical plants. It was just something that was in my data set. And um, the result from that playing around, that's not research, that's really just playing around, <laughs> was um, a low detection rate on initials and a very low detection rate on decorations because I think the data about the decorations for labeling was terrible, if I'm honest. Um, but quite a high detection rate regarding precision. I can't assess anything else on the get-go on plants. So I was able to identify more than 1,000 reuses of plants uh, in my data set, which was really nice to have um, out of the box, more or less. And so now looking back, of course, I could ask myself, why did I not use deep learning before? Why, why did past me not utilize this? And I think there were many reasons, but I just want to share some of them. So my expectation from the get-go was that I wouldn't run into trouble that needed something like, I don't know, um, getting plants um, and distinguish them from, from other illustrations or something like that, because I really, uh, I, I came from German literature. I wanted to focus on, on narrative texts, on illustrated novels. That was my goal from the start. Uh, and I wanted to filter out everything else from the start. And then the data just didn't allow that. It was really the genre classification of the data set was not good enough to do so. So instead of saying, okay, 16th century, I take all the novels and do something with it, I had to reshape my, my whole use case. And I just resorted on doing it on one city, one, one printing city instead. And then I had something in my data that I didn't even expect or know it existed, like something like many, many plant, plant images, for example. And I would have also expected that finding or filtering plant illustrations on the metadata <laughs> side would have been really easy. So something like, okay, it's in the title. I know if, if, if it's a plant book, then there are plants in there. But um, I really learned um, over the course of my, of my study that it's not that easy because what people thought that should have been put in a, in a, in a so-called Kräuterbuch in, in the 16th century differ vastly from what we would expect today. So it was just a weird, not weird, but different mixture of topics of medicine and astrology. And suddenly you had things in there that you didn't expect at all. So it was not a valid solution to do some filtering based on titles, for example. And also the expectation was that really the definition of illustration is somewhat hard to grasp. So it's a fuzzy concept. So where do you draw the line between something like illustration and decoration? Um, so even something like an initial sometimes can have an illustrative core or a decoration can have an illustrative core and it's really hard to decide what you're dealing with on the specific case. So you never will be able to do it with a, a classifier per se, I would say, and presently still somewhat agrees with that. So overall, I would say the more technical, uh, the, the more old school <coughs> boring stuff on the technical side is still very much around in digital humanities tools. I have to say that. And it's also, it makes sense because bringing something into a tool that is mature and sustainable takes some time. So it's, it, you can't expect cutting edge technology in specific analysis tools on digital humanities. The computer vision tools in research, of course, rarely ever are a magic bullet, but I guess that goes for every research field. The tools rarely facilitate a better understanding of the mythology. So trying something out is nice, but then you have to learn about the concepts to understand better what, what is happening, what you're doing. The tools rather prevent you from doing that than enforcing it onto you, of course. But the tools can, I think, ease the initial assessment of probable solutions. They can also facilitate understanding and communication about needs, even by by still getting the feeling that the solution is absent, you learn something about your problem. And the tools can create valuable building blocks in data workflows. What I brought to you, and I will quickly talk about that, and then we can maybe go into the coffee break, if I'm not sure the coffee would even still be uh, already be, be ready. Um, <laughs> what I want to provide you with in the practical sessions is that I basically give you a buffet of options to choose from. So I, I have shown you quite heterogeneous information about um, different methods and different tools. And maybe there's something that you say, okay, this is, I'm, I'm taking special interest in that. And I would give you the, the opportunity to start with that. So you don't have to do the different options in a specific order, or you don't have to do all of them. I think that would be quite impossible to do. And you don't also have to do every layer on every 
practical session, I would say. So I have tried to categorize it a bit. So there's always something in my in my um, session that I will give you afterwards where you just can try to get the software, try to install it and try to run it and learn something about it. <laughs> and there's also something where you can dig into it a bit deeper and can say, okay, there is an exercise notebook where I can try out, for example, for the image segmentation, something like I said before, like chaining together the operations myself or for the image search, there's something like you can deal with this homography matrix or with the image matching. And so you can really choose on which layer you you want to start or what layer you want to, to do. And um, this also means that, I mean, you're, you're having uh, different kinds of experiences and interests, and I'm somehow trying to, to, to bring something for all of you. So the first thing would be, you don't even need to install something if you do, don't really want to do that, because you can use a sample server. You will find the information on that on, on the chalkboard. So when I give you the exercises later, there will often something be in there like, okay, now use a request on localhost. And you have to replace it with that if you want to use it on the sample server. Just be nice, be gentle, try not to break it. It might break anyway. I'm not sure what happens if uh, 20 people try to do something uh, at the same time. Uh, it's not set up that robustly, so let's see. Um, so the better solution would be you try to install but if you fail or if something like uh, it requires Docker and you were not able to get Docker on your system be because it was not able to do so uh, in your domain, then you can go to the sample server and try something there. And the second layer would be really, like I said, you install locally and use it. Then you basically mainly go to the installation guides and go through them and try <coughs> something that is in there. And then you, I, um, you can also try to use the exercise notebooks. And for organization, I'm not sure. So you're sitting in groups already. So it would be nice if we would have something like a group decides to do the same thing. But I'm not sure if that's it, that is feasible. So I don't know. Maybe you can also try to reorganize yourself in, OK, I want to do image search. So who wants to sit with me and also wants to do something with the image search or something like that? Because it would at least make it easier for me to go around because we have many, many topics and to at least organize them a bit would be nice. But I think you can talk about that in the coffee break and come up with ways maybe to, to find partners <laughs> in crime. But that's it from my side. And then I would open questions and then we can, can go to the break. Yeah. Um, if we, very interesting. Um, if we use, for instance, this sample server for our research, hmm? first of all, would you recommend it? Is it um, enough for, I don't know, finding out outputs that we can use to support our argument for, I don't know, a scientific paper? Is it um, okay mentioning also that you have used a sample server that we could find that place, but not, or not? Okay, so first thing on a sample server, I think the moment I erase the information from the chalkboard, that server will be gone. <laughs> I will, I will shut it down. It's really, it's just, it's, uh, it's really just for this winter school. I set it up. I, like I said, I didn't set it up very robustly or anything. It's just a fallback for if you can't install it on your local system. But your question is still interesting, I think. So, like, what do I need if I use a tool for my research? What do I have to prove or to provide, um, in, in a research paper? I think that's very interesting. I, I don't have a definite answer for that. I mean, I would say the, the clearer the installation conditions of a tool and the parameterization and stuff like that is the easier it is to, to reference it. Um, but still, I even, I think I, I have that as an ongoing task for my own publication because um, for the preliminary um, thesis draft or the, the final thesis draft that I provided for my, for my supervisors to, to grade, um, I did it in, a, in an appendix, like, okay, I try to be as transparent as possible, but of course they know my research, they know what I did there, they are familiar with the case, uh, and it's not something that I can directly transform into the final publication, because someone coming from a different area and reading my, my PhD thesis will not be able to understand that short appendix on, here's my parameterization file, just deal with it. So it's it's an interesting question, but I don't have a definite answer to that. It's it's. 
um, it's a good question. But on the other hand, it would be the same if you don't use a tool, but just uh, another way of doing, for example, deep learning or something like that. So it's it's the burden of making it uh, reproducible and uh, transparent is is always difficult to approach. Um, so, yeah, besides publishing your data, if it's possible, publishing your results, if it's possible, um, it's, there is no cookie cutter way to do so, I would say. Are there other questions at the moment? That's not the case. Then. So if you don't have a strong opinion on where to start, I would recommend starting with the image search. <laughs> um, because I think it's it's really nice to use out of the box. Um, you will be able to install it, to train it on some sample data I provide you with, and then you can can start to play around. Yeah. The image search is the only one that works with eyes. Okay. That is also true, yes. <laughs> so if you have, have, have the need to do it without Docker, then also this would be the most feasible thing to do, yes. 